I will call to order this meeting of the Bridgewater Town Council. If you would all kindly uh, rise and pay tribute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I thank you. I would like to uh, call to everyone's attention the fact that this uh, meeting is being recorded and will be, um, is being aired live and recorded for future broadcast. The town council has not been made aware of the recent passing of any veterans in the town, but uh, I would ask please if you would kindly join me in a moment of silence uh, to commemorate the passing of those who have uh, passed previously. Thank you. I thank you very much. Uh, the first uh, order of business is the approval of minutes from the council meeting of January 24th, 2023. I would uh, ask please for a uh, motion for approval. So moved. Second. Sick. Motion and a second. Any discussion? And seeing none, I would uh, ask please, uh, actually we will have a roll call vote this evening because we have a counselor participating remotely. Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Mr. George? Yes. Dr. Perry? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chase? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Abstain as I was not present. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? Yes. And Mr. Wood? Yes. Eight in favor, one abstention. Thank you very much. We have no announcements this evening, nor proclamations. Uh, we can move directly to Citizen Open Forum. Uh, if there's a citizen who would care to step forward to the podium, kindly identify yourself and please limit your remarks to no more than three minutes. Thank you. Carlton Hunt, Austin Street. Uh, I think we're in for a treat of a presentation from our new economic development. I've seen a couple of them. But I'm coming before you tonight because I'm the Energy Committee Chair. I received a letter dated February 3rd to the Bridgewater Energy Committee, and its cause subject is the cost of electricity. It's an individual that's worried about and concerned about the cost of electricity in town. He raises the question about energy aggregation. That may or may not be a term that you've heard of, but it is a program wherein a town, through the Board of Selectmen or um, town or the councilors, can vote to acquire lower cost energy through an aggregation program. That program, we've had a, a gentleman that's given us lots of information, I've shared it with some of you, uh, about aggregation. And it would save the citizens of this town who have a meter that pay the bill somewhere between 10 and 15%, as far as I understand, in their electrical bill. But the town has to actually buy into that. So I got this letter dated February 3rd, and he included a copy of a letter from the town undated and unsigned. It basically says the town is actively looking into the matter. As the Energy Committee Chair, that's news to me. So I can't wait until April when my next meeting with the town manager is about energy. I'd like to have the council begin to explore the opportunity as a policy and as a future for the town to actually vote to have energy aggregation for the town of Bridgewater. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. Any other citizens? Yes, please. Good evening. Lillian Holbrook, 45 Driftwood Drive, Bridgewater. Um, good evening, President Chase, Mr. Dutton, Attorney Rollins, and members of the Town Council. Let me start by thanking you for your service to the town. I'm here tonight in my role as chairperson of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District. To follow up on Mr. Wood's closing comments that were made <clears throat> during the town council meeting on January 24, 2023, he quoted my words from an email in correspondence dated October 24, 2022, between Mr. Wood, myself, 
Mr. Rivaldi, Mr. Moore, and Mr. Chase. What I find concerning is Mr. Wood took my comment regarding marijuana receipts out of context, and he used it in the context of capital planning monies. In the correspondence we were having through email, Mr. Wood conveyed that the district receives half of $200,000 in marijuana mitigation money brought in by the town by formula. He then proceeded to ask, is the $100,000 being used by the school district for drug and alcohol education programs? If not, why not? Where I responded, as you know, when the town approves our budget, you do not inform us where the funds come from, nor is it the council's authority to mandate where it is spent. I also informed Mr. Wood, Mr. Rivaldi, Mr. Moore, Mr. Chase, that the district has and will continue to implement drugging alcohol awareness programs. My response was to an operational budget question, not to a capital question. I feel that Mr. Wood's comments gave the committee and the townspeople of Bridgewater a misleading and false impression of the school committee's attitude towards the capital plan and spending. I am in total agreement that the district has a responsibility to let the town of Bridgewater know where, what monies we are requesting through the capital plan, what they're specifically being used for. And I feel as though we, as a district, have been transparent. And our lines of communication has always been open during my time on school committee. I would hope that moving forward, as Mr. George touched upon in his closing comments, that we can continue to strive to work together and maintain a good working relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Holbrook. Seeing no other citizens for citizen comment, uh, we can move on. We have no appointments or hearings to consider this evening. There are no license transactions uh, scheduled. We can move right to a presentation scheduled for this evening. Um, and I'd like to introduce the uh, new Community and Economic Development uh, Director, uh, uh, Bob Rooley. And uh, he is going to um, uh, present his uh, presentation uh, this evening. As soon as my assistant pulls up the presentation. <laughs> Your assistant's very slow. Hold on. I'm going to take him more AB classes. And <laughs> Got that right. Here we go. Well, hold on. I'm getting there. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Mr. Chase, thank you for the introduction. I want to thank those of you that were on the council when my uh, appointment came up for uh, supporting that. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, we are day two of week five, and I feel like I've uh, hit the ground in a full sprint, um, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Um, next slide, please. So some of the things I'd like to talk about tonight are current market conditions, uh, Central Square, alternative development options, form-based code, transit-oriented development in MBTA communities, infrastructure and impact fees, planning and zoning amendments, and then get your comments and thoughts. And I promise this will not be as painful as a budget meeting. <laughs> you know, next slide, please. So um, fortunately, I am coming in uh, after you recently adopted your comprehensive master plan, 
which I feel is, is a really great document. Um, you know, having been in other communities and had comp plans, uh, I've seen comp plans that are completed and they sit on a shelf for 10 years and they're looked again in 10 years when they have to update it. I think this is, you know, as it relates to my department and my vision for uh, the town and which I hope is collectively yours, um, I think it's a very useful document in that I hope that there are lots of ragged page edges in 10 years when we have to update it. Um, next slide, please. So one thing that I have uh, heard in the meetings that I've sat in initially is you know, there is uh, some concern about the amount of residential real estate that's being created and a real desire to have more commercial and retail uh, created. And you know, I don't necessarily argue with that, but I think there are some economic realities that need to be discussed. Uh, these are average numbers. Uh, these are for uh, what are called submarkets to the Metro Boston. So this is 495 South and Route 3 South. So if we're looking at what the construction costs are for one-story commercial buildings, it's between 300 and 361 dollars a foot. Mid-rise 499 to 719. Retail 309 to 371. These are costs excluding the cost of land acquisition. These are expensive construction costs right now. Um, so the rents that you need to support these types of projects are what we call credit tenants that a developer would need to have pre-lease or pre-commitments uh, for leases prior to getting financing because you know, if we look below the rents that you know these types of uh, facilities require you're starting at $24 a foot triple net uh, for class A space which is brand new space class B space 1966 triple net means that you're paying taxes insurance and operating costs on top of that rent so that typically could be anywhere from 10 to 15 dollars so the local businesses the mom and pops the people that are just starting they can't afford to pay these type of rents um, the way you can support these types of rents and we'll get into this a little further into my presentation is you, you do need to create a little bit more density around where these retail nodes or office nodes are. I would say post-COVID, if somebody told you they're building an office building right now, then they should be referred for psychological evaluation because it's just not happening. I mean, there is an abundance of office space out there right now. I think people are looking at ways to convert that office to some other use. Um, retail is a whole different you know, issue. I mean, I think there are definitely opportunities for retail. I think a lot of people that you know, were impacted by COVID had rethought their lives. Some are starting their own businesses, local businesses. You know, I had the fortune of you know, living through this when I was in Warren, Rhode Island. I think in the five years I was there, we saw a lot more small businesses come into town, and those were all locally owned. I like to refer to them as businesses. You couldn't buy their products either on the internet or, or at a mall if those things exist anymore. Um, so, I mean, I think there's some opportunities here, but I think it, we need to keep things in perspective in terms of, you know, if we say we're going to approve a project and we want 30% retail or commercial, that's not going to happen right now. We need to kind of steer the boat in a different direction in order to get that. Uh, and I think there is definitely a way to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So Central, uh, that might be out of seat. I'll skip to this picture. I reorientate them in my slide deck. I know Central Square is important to the community and you know pedestrian safety and traffic is certainly part of it. And I just found these two slides that have been in Jennifer's uh, files to be amusing. Because mm -hmm. um, we kind of have the crosswalk vortex that just tonight I went to get a bite to eat and walking back with lack of lighting, I felt like I was on that new TV show audition to be a hood ornament. Mm -hmm. um, and then the picture on the right, I really find amusing because in that picture, there are nine signs, a stop sign and two red lights. I would be confused. Um, but if we could go to the next slide, please. So just some observations and thoughts that, that I have with respect to Central Square. I know there's been numerous studies that have looked at traffic and parking. Existing traffic flow signage and parking all need to be looked at further. Pedestrian safety and the perception of safety is very critical. I think you all realize this. Downtown Bridgewater is a very walkable community, but how do we leverage that? Uh, Two-way traffic works when you have businesses on both sides of the street. 
I don't know that some of the recommendations with respect to two-way traffic are appropriate, but I'm open to discuss that and we're looking at some other options with respect to that. Uh, the designation of the Opportunity Zone has had no impact. I had uh, downtown Warren when I was there was designated as an Opportunity Zone. If you don't have the critical mass for somebody to come in and leverage what the benefits of that capital gains write-off is, it's not going to attract uh, the type of investment that the pro program was designed for. I think there's a need to develop stronger partnerships between businesses, property owners in the town. I've mentioned this in all the initial meetings I had with representatives from the town. The, the university is an asset, but are we leveraging that as effectively as we can? Uh, there definitely are some successes around Central Square, Restoration Coffee, the Juice Mill. Uh, just walking around tonight, I saw lots of people in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, facility. But I think there's some improvements that we can make with respect to what that tenant mix is. Uh, the next slide, please. So parking comes up a lot as a problem. It's a problem in every small town. Um, I don't think it really is a problem. I think it's a parking management problem, not a parking inventory problem. So if you look at this aerial, which was taken on June 6th, which was a Tuesday, uh, 2022, there is a lot of unused parking in this picture. Um, I think you know, one of the issues is finding the parking, accessing the parking, having people feel like their car wouldn't get towed if they were parking at a Walgreens or something. So, I mean, I think conversations about shared parking is something that we need to do. And I think we can do that as we start to reach out to the business community more because it, as things improve, it improves for everybody. Um, but, you know, to say that we have a parking problem, when I look at this picture, um, I would have a hard time defending that. Uh, next slide, please. So borrowing from um, some sections with respect to uh, what is in the comprehensive plan, I mean, we can do many of these things. I mentioned to Michael when we spoke last week, when I look at time frame, I'm just wiping out anything that's not near term or immediate because it's all immediate. Um, and these things are all uh, interconnected in, in my mind. Uh, I prefer to look at redevelopment and revitalization holistically, not look at one single issue because I believe they're all interconnected. And I think we can do all of these things uh, simultaneously. And again, this goes back to what I had said previously, involving conversations with property owners, with business owners, with the university, and with both the planning board and, and, and this council. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the things that we're doing that were called out in the uh, comprehensive master plan, uh, I'm putting in uh, two grant applications. Uh, we put them in on Friday, actually, for some assistance from mass development, one for a community planning grant, uh, so we can look at some of the tools that are available to uh, look at what we can do in the downtown area, whether that's the creation of a business improvement district, uh, some other programs. Uh, we're looking for a mass downtown initiative, which is some additional technical assistance. And then next fiscal year, we will be submitting some CDBG funding for facade improvements, uh, downtown revitalization plan, potentially a revolving loan fund to help some businesses, and then also uh, potentially looking at some additional funding for the old town hall uh, townhouse uh, restoration. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of this uh, in southern New England particularly. We have these park in the front one-story buildings, complete uh, misuse of resources. I like to say that this represents the very best of 1960s planning when there was no planning. Um, so next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is just take a couple minutes and, and borrow on my experience in Warren because I think uh, as we get further into the slide deck there, you'll see where I was going with this. Um, you know, one of the things I like to do in, is engaging with the public, engaging with elected officials, and also developers is going through a bit of a visioning exercise. So this was a 12 acre parcel that we had on a state highway. Uh, 8.3 acres of this is a parking lot. Um, next slide, please. So when we draw it out, you can see that there are a lot more parking spaces there than it was ever gonna be necessary. Uh, this had formerly been a stop and shop, stop and shop relocated further down the street, as is the uh, 
MO for Royal to hold the parent company stop and shop. They backfilled it with an Ocean State job lot and complemented that with a Dollar General next door to the Ocean State job lot and a lot of under other underutilized businesses. So that really isn't the highest and best use for this site, in my opinion, at that time. Uh, next slide, please. So what we do when we have these types of uh, opportunities is create what I call a, a massing plan. So how can we reimagine what that property looks like? What can we fit on that 8.3 8 acres? So we put on buildings that, you know, we guess that the height is going to be average three to four stories. And then how does that lay out? So how do we take that space and, and repurpose it? The next slide, please. So the next three slides is then we draw on there. What are the uses that we want? So in the next three slides, we have a combination of different layouts that have uh, small commercial retail uses, professional offices, actually have a performing arts center program in here, and a variety of different housing options. Some are rental, some are townhouses. Uh, next slide, please. And then we can go to the next one as well. So when we went through this exercise, on that 8.3 acres, we were able to create 179 residential units and 55,000 square feet of commercial residential space. The Performing Arts Center took up a big portion of that, but the reason we programmed that in there is because Roger Williams University was looking to have Performing Arts space. They couldn't do it on their campus, so they were looking to do something off campus. Once they saw what we were doing, then they saw the housing, they said, well, you know, we're looking at executive programs in the summertime. We don't want to put executives in dorms, so perhaps we would take some of that housing for those executive uh, people in the, in the summertime and graduate students in, in the regular semesters. I only offer that is because I think there's conversations that could be had with Bridge, Bridgewater to potentially locate some of their future expansion off campus as well. Uh, next slide, please. So then we went from kind of the, the black and white line drawings to putting some rooftops on. Again, giving some orientation to what would this all look like. And then if we go to the next slide. Just giving perspective. People don't see things very well in the abstract. We need to give them visuals. But what you can see here is that you know we're able to drop in, I think, almost nine buildings with green space, with amenities uh, on a corridor that's serviced by public transportation. Uh, what you don't see here is that this area is surrounded by existing single family residential neighborhoods. So we, I like to refer to these as village centers or towns, town centers because they don't not only support the people that are working or living in this new development, but they also offer, offer opportunities for people in the surrounding neighborhoods that can walk to these services that are available. Next slide, please. Can I just ask a question before we go through the whole presentation? It's, uh, it's hard to. It's hard to. Go ahead, please. Okay. What's the height of those buildings? Uh, on average, there are four three and four stories. Thank you. And, and this is just an example to your, to your question. This is kind of the scale of development that you would see in these type of developments. Uh, the top left is Mashpee Commons, not that far away. Some of you have probably been there. Uh, the bottom two on the right are South County Commons in, uh, in, in Wakefield. Um, again, uh, just examples on what can be done on some of these large parcels if we use a certain amount of imagination. Uh, next slide, please. And then these are just examples of the type of housing types you could have if you had townhouses, either for sale or rental. Uh, again, just giving people some context in terms of what these things could look like. Next slide, please. So in your comprehensive master plan, our comprehensive master plan, you talk about you know, creating architectural and site design to, uh, standards tailored to each area. This is the most exciting part of the presentation for me. <laughs> if you go to the next slide, please. So way back when, early in my career, 2020, 2021, I was working in Arlington, Virginia. I was charged with revitalizing the Columbia Pike Corridor, which ran from uh, the Pentagon to Fairfax County. 
Uh, that was when something called new urbanism was starting. It was the new fad in, in development, which was new, what new is old. Um, so we developed something called form-based code, and it's worked amazingly. Other communities across the country are starting to adopt it, but you know what it is is it's, it's an alternative zoning district. So uh, without reading every line, and you know, I think you all have this in your package, I mean, basically what it is is that the town and the community sit down and say, what do we want this area to look like? What are the uses we want? What do we want these buildings to look like? What are the materials we want? What are the street trees we want? You know, can we incorporate renewable energy into this? Uh, what kind of uh, pedestrian improvements can we make? And it becomes kind of a Bible that a developer comes in and says, you know, I would like to develop in this area and I want to follow your form-based code. And they check all those boxes. That becomes an expedited approval process for them. They're not going back and forth between planning and zoning and town councils. Uh, you know, on average in, on Columbia Pike now, projects are getting improved in eight months. Now, if a developer didn't want to do form-based code, that's an option that they have, and they can go through the normal approval process, and that will take forever long, it will be. But the fact that time is money, uh, that they can go through this process, it's predictable. People aren't outside protesting with pitchforks and torches. Uh, developers feel much more comfortable with this approach. So I think this is something that you know we can adopt and uh, put into place, particularly uh, not so much in the in the Central Square area because that's kind of built out, but in other areas that we will get to in a moment. Next slide, please. So just really generally, I mean, the advantages of it is we get rid of these 1960s era park in the front, one story, architecturally in city of buildings. It's an intelligent increase in density. It creates improvements to the infrastructure, increases uh, housing opportunities, mixed income, rental ownership. It preserves the historic character of what we have in the Central Business District, takes development pressure away from those areas outside of downtown that we would like to see a kind of a pause on development, and it increases tax revenues. Next slide, please. And this is just one page of the Columbia Pike uh, form-based code, but it's like a 300-page document, but it's broken down by chapters, and I mean, it, it's very, very concise in terms of what a developer can do and can't do. Um, and it works very well. Next slide, please. So this is a proposed project that hasn't been filed yet. This is at the Foundry site, and I would say this is an example of not using form-based code. Um, you know, as this is projected, this is residential and two buildings, and then one building, 35,000 square feet of commercial retail space, which uh, the developers indicated they'd like to do in phases, and I would offer that that third phase of commercial and office will never get built because there's just not the market for it right now. Uh, next slide. So in, in my business on the planning side, we like to say that we create a sense of place. I like to say, you know, Communities are we create a there there that there's a feeling of community a sense of community uh, There's some ownership in, in what that community is uh, When we develop form-based code we involve the community into you know helping us design what that is so that when projects come forward that they can be advocates for it because this is something that the community has articulated that they would like to see uh, next slide, please so uh, my first observation is on the left-hand picture, it's a very good argument for undergrounding utilities. But uh, this project is actually in Plymouth, uh, and uh, it's a really good model of ground floor retail professional offices with residential on the upper levels. Uh, I was looking at some third quarter 2022 statistics. There were zero vacancies in this building. Um, now, that might have changed a little bit, but. If it was 90, that would be good. So, I mean, just an idea. Again, this is kind of the scale of you know what we can do in terms of development. Uh, next slide, please. So, transit-oriented development is one of the exciting things that interest me in this position because you have MBTA, uh, which I think is very exciting. Um, the wisdom to put the train station where it is now is confusing. Um, but I think relocating it back to where it was 
uh, and re-looking at what Campus Plaza could be. Uh, we check every box of what transit-orientated development is. Concentrating uh, density where people can walk from where they live to get on the train. I think there could be you know, improved bus service as part of that. I had a, a meeting earlier last week with the former director of uh, Brockton Area Regional Transit. I mean, they're very excited about bringing in some ideas with transit-orientated development. Uh, next slide, please. And lo and behold, you actually had this in your comprehensive master plan. You just didn't call it that. Because if you read through all the things that you wanted to accomplish, you're doing that with transit-orientated development. And um, again, I can't wait to get started on this. Next slide, please. All the things that you, you know, put forth as goals and objectives and priorities, we can check all those boxes just like form based code by thinking about how we repurpose uh, certain areas. Next slide, please. And that area would be this, Campus Plaza and the Foundry site. Um, Campus Plaza has looked like that since I was here in 1977. And uh, so I've initiated conversations with you know, the current property owner, who is a national real estate investment trust, I was actually shocked to realize that this was in their portfolio um, because <laughs> this is a lucky loser site. Um, but, <laughs> you know, if you look at the amenities that are around there, I mean, we just got a grant to do the area behind there for recreation. You know, if you move the train station back down closer to this, let the university take the Spring Street site and give that back to us <laughs> and or MBTA and then I mean all the stars start to align for this but the other thing that it does is is that you know when I say it's a walkable community it's certainly walkable from the university back to Central Square but if you're able to create some density here in a smart way that starts to fill in the gaps between here and the, in, in Central Square because it creates connections I, I like to refer to downtown development is smiles and i would argue that this area needs some dental work that it needs to be filled in a little bit um, but that it's easy to do because you're going to start to get the type of retail and professional uses you want in town that can afford the rents that we talked about previously when you can concentrate the density in an area like this um, and my initial conversations with federal is, you know, this is something they're interested in. The developer of the foundry site, it's a little bit of a more difficult challenge. When I first mentioned what I had a vision there, they said to me, what do you think this is, Newton? And I said, well, no, I think it's Bridgewater. And I think that there's, in my opinion, I'm very enthusiastic. I think that there is an opportunity to create something in Bridgewater that's very special in terms of what MBTA communities can be. Um, we have a university, we have a very diverse demographic, we have the ability to create something very cool down here that people can be proud of. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of people move into town post-COVID because they didn't want to be in the cities, but we don't have a lot of the things that they're used to in town, so they're driving out of town. Well, I'd like to keep them in town. Then we can start to see more restaurants coming in, more of the types of uh, retail that people like to see. At the same time, we're creating opportunities, improving opportunities for those small local businesses that want to be in the, in the Central Square area that can't afford $23 a foot. Uh, next slide. So infrastructure is, is definitely a concern. It's a question I ask continually, Michael, right? Um, and it's, it's um, you know, capacity of the wastewater treatment plant, obligated for future usage, it's unlikely DEP is going to let us uh, increase what our discharge rate is, and then the state imposing limits on the amount of, of water that we can draw down. All big concerns and legitimate concerns in terms of future development. Uh, we're having a meeting later this week just to talk about some of these things as it relates to the state, but there are options. So uh, if we're going to rezone, as an example, Campus Plaza, and we're going to create more density, that creates value for that property owner. We have put money in their pocket. So in exchange for that, we shouldn't be afraid to ask for contributions for infrastructure improvements. 
uh, whether that's on site or in other areas of town. If we enlarge what the downtown area is to be an overlay district, you know, can we take potentially some of that tax increased tax revenue and invest that in the central square area? So those are conversations that we want to have with mass development in the state. Um, this is something that you know Arlington, Virginia did early on. If anyone has been down the the, the uh, metro corridors, every metro stop in Arlington County has high density that kind of retreats back to single family homes because in exchange for that density, the county was able to say, we need some public improvements. Um, there's no reason that we can't do that. And these developers, national developers, are all familiar with this. This is not anything that they're, they haven't heard before. Um, so we're gonna talk with Mass Development about you know, how we can use some district improvement financing, spreading that out. And then also I think that you know, we should have a conversation about considering a home rule petition, a home rule petition for an impact fee program. Right now the only uh, county in the Commonwealth that can do impact fees is Barnstable County. And impact fees can be for what the impacts are for infrastructure, impacts to schools, roads, public safety. Um, again, I, I'm trying to throw out some conversation pieces, I'm not saying we have to do all of it at once, but I think there are options available to us to get the type of community that we want to have without burdening existing taxpayers. Uh, next slide, please. So just as an example, because I am somebody that's kind of a numbers kook when it comes to infrastructure, um, you know, just looking at you know, what kind of uh, usage comes from different uses um, and you know I, I think that this is very helpful as we're working through a matrix of okay what does future development look like what is the maximum daily capacity at the wastewater treatment plant now where are we at today with respect to capacity uh, I and I when you get some infiltration into this the system that's water, that's not wastewater, it gets treated. I don't think you have a lot of that here because you don't, you're, you're, our existing sewer system isn't that large, but I don't think it would move the needle. But I, I think there are opportunities to look at, um, there's technology that, you know, we could have new development and have these developments have on-site uh, wastewater package plants. That, so we're not sending it to the treatment plant that it's discharged into to the ground. There's a lot of advances in technology out there, but I think it's really important that we have a hard look at you know, where we are relative to capacity and how much new development is gonna impact that and where we should be smart to say, okay, we're not gonna treat that at the treatment plant. We're looking for you, the Mr. Developer, to treat this on site. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said before, I don't believe in long-term goals, and I'm gonna come back to, I think, the importance of having outreach with the university, collaboration on many, many, many levels is, is really important. Um, so I wanna stress, I would like to establish a strong relationship with the university. And the next slide, please. So moving forward, I guess, you know, questions to you all, is this the direction that you wanna move? I think, again, as I said, it's important to engage commercial property owners and developers regarding the town's vision, uh, engage business owners and residents regarding the town's vision, engage our state and federal delegation as to the town's holistic approach for smart growth. That's concentrating development at existing underutilized sites, relocate the MBTA station. I think we can create a really cool model for suburban MBTA communities. Seek state and federal funding assistance for infrastructure improvements. Consider the home rule petition. Utilize district imp improvement financing. Work with the planning board to revise zoning ordinance to allow for higher density and adoption of the form based code. Collaborate with the university, as I said. One slide that I didn't get in to Michael that, because I've been thinking about this for the last four weeks and two days, um, was the value of the uh, old town hall. I mean, I think that when we're looking at, uh, in townhouse, as some call it as well, uh, as we're looking at something to kind of stabilize Central Square, I think there are a number of uses there that can, that's an asset we already have um, and that we can capitalize on. 
you know, whether that's arts culture, or culture in partnership with the library, arts in partnership with the university. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that can happen there. I think through CDBG funding, arts funding, historic funding, that there's ways to package things together to be able to effectuate the improvements that need to be made there, including potentially building onto the rear of the building to make it handicap accessible. So, um, so in four weeks, two days, that's what I got. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions you have or comments. Uh, thank okay. you, Bob. And if there are questions from the counselors, um, if I could begin with Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you covered a lot there, and a lot that we have, you know, discussed over the past several years. Um, I have two. I have two questions. Um, I, I do think that the Perkins Foundry property hopefully will come to head and, and I think that's a key key component of something and I'm disappointed hopefully the broad the the broad street near the old friendlies can be rejuvenated and somehow that was a big disappointment a few years ago um, but I, I always have this fuzzy if, if you build something that's just a catalyst it'll start a snowball effect of other things to come Right now, we haven't really done that big thing in the center of town yet. Broad Street could have been that. The Perkins Foundry uh, project could be that. We've been trying to acquire an old gas station for seven or eight years now. Just these little things. An example is what we did up on Elm Street when we got the community compact grant for $3 million and repaved and put um, all, you know, we entered into agreement with the businesses for tax incentives and things like that. That place is getting a lot of, of businesses down there. So I think the downtown area is very important. We have studied everything to death over the last at least 10 years. And those studies, I think, need to come forward to us for a final um, you know, proposal. What do we do with the common? Is it going to be two ways, both sides, or do we do one way or the other? Um, but I am curious. That I've never heard before is <laughs> do you really think that the um, campus plaza is is is, <laughs> is done its time uh, do you think that really needs to be repurposed for something different or absolutely. you do yeah, absolutely I mean if you look at you know there's vacancies in there yeah that you know the, the tenant mix is no disrespect to anybody in there right. but that is not the highest and best use for that site in in, in the environment that we are now um, again, if you look at you know, federal realty is a national real estate investment trust. If you look at what their portfolio is, everything in their portfolio, with the exception of this, is what we're proposing in terms of what could happen there. It's interesting. I mean, we have no other place to go food shopping other than mm -hmm. there. I mean. You're not, you're, you're not, I mean, the, yeah. the idea isn't that you're not going to eliminate a Roach Brothers. You want to have a Roach Brothers right. on the ground level of, of, a, of a development like that. But you've got an ocean of parking that's never going to be utilized, probably more than the 20% on a good day that it's used now. Um, you know, with respect to, and, and I appreciate your point, something is better than nothing, but I think that, you know, the foundry site still has some obstacles to overcome. Uh, I think they're, you know, proposing that based on what the existing zoning environment is, and that's the most they can do. Um, so if we think we can do more than that, then we should engage them. I think they still have some environmental hurdles they have to, to cover there. But yeah, I agree that, you know, when you have uh, buildings like Friendly's that have been vacant for as long as they've been vacant. In Rhode Island, you know, there's a statute that's called a non-utilization tax that you can levy a tax on top of the property tax for commercial properties that aren't being actively marketed or sitting vacant. The idea isn't that you need the money. The idea is to move them. Yeah. Well, that's the, I agree. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Moore. Um, also, thank you for that great presentation. I think when I got elected, one of the first pieces of advice is someone told me that nothing in government moves fast. Uh, I think you just proved them wrong. I think in four weeks, you got a pretty dialed in understanding of the town. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, this is probably the best example of a strategic presentation I've ever seen on the council. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, here's a building and what we could do with the building. It's, here's the problem. 
here's a solution to the problem, and here are all the things we have to do to make this solution work. And if you get that right, it bleeds into the other areas of town and they'll, they'll work too. Um, so it was just excellent. I was, I was really impressed. I think, you know, as, as follow-up actions, I really do like the idea of the impact fee. I think um, if that's something we could pursue and just learning more about, you know, what are some of these creative options we have similar to the, the friendlies idea, right? What are some creative ways we can drive the change that we want to see? Uh, I like the idea of making it easy for developers to do the things that are interesting to us. So I like the zoning changes. Um, and I think there's, a, there's every slide here we could dive into, but really, really well done. Um, and I'm, I'm excited uh, for your vision. It's good. Michael asked me last week, I did this presentation to the planning board, and Michael said, when can we start this? I said, well, we're doing the presentation to the town council next Tuesday, so if all goes well, we can start on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Councilor Wood, I believe you have a question. Thank you, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, great presentation. Um, no, I, I think Eric, I said, things move at the speed of government. But anyway, so um, one of the key pieces I picked up about the presentation was the shared parking uh, aspect of it, which has been sitting in some of the dust-covered reports for a long time. Are, are there specific things in mind uh, that, that you can tell us about tonight <clears throat> or in the near future about how we can um, leverage or what the council needs to do be able to encourage shared parking or make zoning so that shared parking becomes easier from a landlord point of view or to make changes that facilitate that better. What, what's yeah. on your mind about yeah, that? Yeah, so I think there's two parts to that. I, I think with respect to existing conditions, you know, conversations with the businesses, conversations with the property owners, you know, about that there is a, a strategic approach to strengthening businesses and in, in the the Central Square downtown area. Uh, and most of those are, are locally owned businesses now. That, you know, collectively, if we work together, we all benefit from that. And that, you know, obviously we don't want college students using it as a commuter lot, um, but, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily gonna happen. And we, when we look at the amount of parking that's available, but then, you know, there's part of me that would argue, well, maybe students parking here and coming to support some of the businesses wouldn't be a bad thing either. Um, so, I mean, I, but I think right now, the initially would be that as we get out to face to face with businesses, start to talk about, you know, what it is they need, what are their expectations, what's working, what's not working, floating the idea of, you know, the benefits of shared parking, that will start the conversation. With respect to new development, uh, that's something that gets embedded into the form-based code and into any zoning ordinances that it's just implied that there will be shared parking as part of any of this new development. Thank you. Great, great, great presentation. Um, good holistic view of the entire project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perry. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just to reiterate uh, those sentiments, uh, Bob was a great presentation. Um, obviously, we'll be working very closely together with the Downtown Revitalization Subcommittee. I think your presentation, along with our other documents, will really give us a a good basis to you know take a lot of positive steps forward. Um, we're already starting to you know make some of those decisions going forward, um, and this just kind of gives us a guide. I know you've done this before in Rhode Island and in other areas, so I think your uh, expertise in this is gonna be so, so helpful. Uh, obviously, like I say, we're, we're blown away by a lot of the ideas here in just about four weeks worth of time, so um, I look forward to continue to work with you uh, on this plan. I, I do wanna uh, circle back to comments with respect to the traffic studies. You know, Michael and I met with uh, Old Colony Planning Commission recently. They are presently doing a corridor study on Route 18 from East Bridgewater to the Middleborough Line. You know, we asked them to kind of expand how they look at the area that's been looked at before. You know, they're going to come in and do computer simulation, more data counts to kind of show in real time to various stakeholder groups um, what those options actually look like. Uh, and I think that's gonna be very helpful in terms of informing us as to you know, what the right plan should be. Um, you know, on paper, two-way might, might be the right idea, but there might be some other ways to approach it that will be better for everybody. So, I mean, I think that you know, 
following up on the committee meeting that we had with you, we, there was the reach out and they're willing to have a meeting with the downtown committee. Uh, I know that we've reached out to MassDOT as well. So I think we're, gonna, we're close to getting to a workable answer. But in my past life, I've seen this computer simulation is very, very accurate. They can put in all kinds of different scenarios that will be really informative to you know, getting to a Very final right. decision that everyone can, can support. Great, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you, are there other questions? Yes, Councilor George. Thank you, Mr. President, <clears throat> after you to Mr. Ruley. So thank you very much for the presentation, everyone was great. Just a, a couple observations that I've seen as well. So you, you mentioned the parking. You know, from my perspective, I've never said that we have a lack of parking. We have a lack of safe and easily accessible parking. Um, I think that's always been an issue, be it, you know, safety of Tenant, uh, people in a car, the car itself, uh, you know, pedestrians, things of that nature. I think we do have the opportunity in the future to do strategic planning around acquiring property and maybe dedicating that for parking so that people can go to something and they can easily get in, not take their life in their hands and easily get out. Um, I do appreciate moving the train station. I think, unfortunately, when the decisions were made for that initially. It was done, uh, I don't, I'm gonna say not in the most transparent way, uh, with few people being involved, making the decision for the benefit of probably not the town. Um, I'd, I'd ask this question, you don't have to answer it right now. My concern is, have we lost the opportunity to attract people from the city that don't need to go into the city anymore? You know, Quincy was ahead of it, I know it's a city, but they were ahead of it downtown. Um, with the extension of the commuter rail, I know New Bedford now is really pushing hard to make that a destination, both for the telecommuting as well as people being able to take the commuter rail if they have to go into Boston, and then from there they can go to other places as well. So hopefully we have that time. I know you're saying you don't want this to be in the future, but realistically speaking, do we go in that direction and do we have the time to, you know, to execute on that? Again, this is for I, I think we discussion. do. I mean, I think that... It doesn't seem as if, you know, as an example, Middleborough is jumping on the uh, MBTA community's train. Uh, you know, I live just over the line from Massachusetts in, in Rhode Island. I looked at, okay, if I wanted to take the train from Fall River to Bridgewater, that would only take me two and a half hours. <laughs> so, I mean, to take the train from New Bedford to Boston it is not like it's going to be a 90-minute ride because uh, you have a single track system. Um, yeah, New Bedford has certainly done a really good job kind of reinventing their waterfront, taking advantage of uh, the offshore wind industry. But that's all that section of town. The rest of that section of town is still not very desirable. I think, as I said before, I think Bridgewater has a lot of things that people were looking for when they moved out of the city. Um, and we can continue to build upon that. I think we're, our proximity to Boston is such that we're still in that comfort zone to take a train to Boston and or have students come the other way to come to school here. And, you know, I, I think for a college town, I mean, it's always been a commuter school. I mean, maybe it becomes less of a commuter school, but, you know, parents bring kids to school, they spend money. I mean, if we have the things in place that they want to spend their money, then I think, you know, we can, it's going to be a win, win, win. Right. And I, I just the other thing for an observation as well is, um, you know, I know you had brought up with uh, Campus Plaza and dealing with the REIT and things like that, which has its challenges, but I think we've also experienced a lot of challenges with private property owners that have significant commercial and mixed-use property that um, we just can't make headway with. So hopefully you can bring uh, a different perspective to that so that we can have everyone moving together, or if someone isn't really interested in doing something that we can compel them to put it in a direction where you know the entire community can benefit so yeah. thank you very much thank you very much uh yes uh, councillor lindy no i think susie was there before oh, me and i'll councillor robinson I'll defer. thank you uh, nice to meet you Likewise. um we haven't had a chance to meet um i'm a new councillor but i've been on a couple of committees and ad hoc committees in the town uh, one of them actually being um the ad hoc master plan committee so this was really exciting to hear your take in like five weeks, because it does, of course, touch upon so many things that folks here know. 
but you brought the additional piece of like, here's a couple solutions that we should really consider. So thank you so much. That was, I, I got super energized by that. But I do have some very, very specific questions. I'm gonna run through them fast, and if we can't answer them all tonight, that's fine. Um, one, I was really curious about this form-based code um, in terms of like policy and state involvement and like what we as a council can do to help with that. Um, would love to learn a bit more about the home rule petition. Um, I'm a marketer by trade, so I'm super interested in how to involve residents and business owners. Um, you made a comment at some point about you know, making them part of that, of that dialogue and that, that aspect. Um, so whether it's helping my fellow counselors from the subcommittee, I'm not in that subcommittee, I am available on that side in terms of uh, community engagement. Um, one thing, I believe that the town had an opportunity zone opportunity at one point, so I was wondering how does that fit in? And then um, certainly I'm sure could not be answered tonight, but as we think about how do we prioritize? Because what we have is, you know, the strategy is amazing, right? But there's so many pieces into that. And I'm sure that's gonna be part of your work, right? As you dig in and like what's feasible, yeah. but I think that's gonna be really interesting to see your thoughts as how we prioritize um, in the approach. And then just, again, how can we help? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think first of all, I think the, op the timeline on the opportunity zone is closed in terms of, you know, that was a Trump program that had a, a drop dead date in it. So I think if you're not in the queue now, you know, you're not going to get in the queue. I mean, that worked areas like Pittsburgh where you had big vacant steel mills and, you know, somebody that had a lot of capital gains that they needed to write off, that made sense. Um, in terms of prioritizing, it's all a priority to me. I mean, I, I look at it, you know, holistically that, you know, they, all the parts have to work together. I think that I've spent as much time in the private sector as I have in the public sector, so I tend to not look at things in a straight line uh, like typical government might. Um, there's an interconnection to everything that we do. Um, I think that they can play off of each other and support each other. Um, you know, bringing the community in is, okay, we're going to do this vision exercise. We're going to do form-based code. Do you want to be part of this? I mean, what do you want the community to look like? What do you feel like you need in the community? And then, you know, share with them the tools that are necessary to get that. Um, you know, I showed uh, Nicole in my office, you know, project that we had done down in Clarendon, and, you know, it was done by a developer similar to federal. And the first thing she said, she goes, can we get a cheesecake factory? <laughs> but, but, you know, again, I mean, that's, that's appealing to people. But, you know, if you have the demographics to support it, which, you know, if we look at the demographics of Bridgewater to the surrounding communities, we're very strong. We're much more desirable than those other communities are. Um, as I drive in in the morning, I see a lot of cars going the other way. And, um, you know, I think that from a retail side, I mean, we're losing some of that. Obviously, the outlet malls, you're always going to lose that. But, you know, when you can have some upscale locally owned businesses or some specialty shops that people then, you know, want to park their car, they want to walk around, they want to get something to eat, they want to go to different, you know, whether it's an art show or whatever. I mean, now you have a captive audience. Right now, people are, you know, they're driving to one place, they're doing what they're doing, and they're getting their car and they're leaving. I mean, that's not how we make downtowns. Yeah, I keep saying we have to keep the spending dollars here. There's sky's we the We can. Yeah. I mean, but you know, my priority is to be having these conversations simultaneously. I over-caffeinate myself most days, so I'm able to do that. Um, but, I mean, I, I don't think we can do it as a one-off. I think even if they're not happening simultaneously, I think we have to give the public a picture and a vision of what it is we're trying to accomplish so that they can help support us and, and get there. You know, if you tell a friend, will they tell a friend, will they tell a friend? So exponentially, we start to get the story out. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lindy? I'm not going to repeat what most of the other people said, but thank you also for the presentation. And I'm a new counselor too, so I definitely would love to talk to you more about this because I find it very exciting. One thing you mentioned was the tax on, what is it, underutilized properties? Correct. Hey, we can't even get those folks to clean up the property downtown. I walk by it every day in the spring and it's overgrown and it's disgusting looking and it makes Bridgewater look like an eyesore. So whatever we can do with that property, I would I mean, like I think to we have this. to look at, you know, if there's state enabling legislation that would allow us to, or do we have to make an, you know, 
an application to the state to be able to have something like that. But uh, a lot of that non-utilization started when the real estate bust happened and communities found themselves with foreclosed homes that the bank said, yeah, yeah good luck with that. So, you know, some of that non-utilization could be for the town to come in and clean these properties up. The other tool that you can have is you can move to put some of these properties in receivership. Um, so forcing the, and I know that Jason's probably sending me evil emails tomorrow, but I mean there are tools that are available to put pressure on property owners to do the right thing. And then working with the university more and integrating that into the whole picture. You know, sometimes it takes a fresh set of eyes to come in here brand new and, and look at things, and I, I, I'm excited too, so I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Just thank real you. quick. Y yes, I just go right ahead. Too, for the presentation, I look forward to looking, uh, working with you when it comes to the downtown and just in general, and I appreciate that I came to you on a Friday trying to get a sit-down meeting, and here we were Monday, a.k.a. yesterday, talking for an hour or two, so. I'm downstairs. Look looking to working with you, boss. Hey. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, um, uh, Bob, I would just like to say that uh, I'm reminded in seeing you again tonight that, that uh, Councillor Moore and I, who met you a few months ago, uh, um, we found that your enthusiasm uh, was infectious. Uh, that is evident to me again tonight, no surprise. Uh, we're thrilled that you are uh, now settled into your position, and we absolutely look forward to working with you. and learning more about what we can do to help facilitate your uh, concept. And, you know, certainly whether it's re with respect to form-based uh, code or uh, any other aspect, we, we really need to understand what what the council needs to do and, and in what priority we need to attack it. But uh, uh, absolutely based upon the comments that uh, uh, I've heard this evening and your presentation, uh, uh, I think I can fairly speak for the counselors that we are very interested and very supportive of, of your work. Well, thank and you. And I just want to reiterate that this opportunity is a privilege for me. It really is. Um, you know, I've never been more excited to take on a role than I was to take this on. And um, wasn't sure in the beginning. And the first day I sat down with Michael and Kimberly, which was supposed to be an hour conversation, became two and a half hour conversation and mm -hmm. kind of knew on the ride home that, okay, things are going to change. So, um, Again, I'm always available to talk in person, on the phone, email. I, I welcome that interaction. Um, I like to say that the only bad idea is the idea that you keep to yourself. Um, so I look forward to partnering with all of you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. We do as well. Thank you, Thank you all. Um, Moving on, we can move directly to the town manager's report. Uh, Mr. Dutton, if you would, please. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't have a whole lot tonight. I do want to uh, just give you an update on, uh, on what is now a uh, consistent uh, item on the town manager's report, the fire station. Uh, we are <clears throat> admittedly in the, in the sort of slow, uh, very unexciting uh, portion of the planning for the fire station. Um, the architect and the OPM have scheduled meetings with uh, firefighter groups uh, to drill down on uh, what specifically uh, the firefighters really need to do their jobs and what should be uh, in the new building to that to that end. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, detailed survey uh, that's required by the architect in order to start uh, doing uh, more detailed design is almost done. After that, uh, soil testing and, and borings will be completed. Uh, still shooting for a September bid date. Um, and uh, I will uh, let you know that we have resolved uh, outstanding uh, land issues and uh, with, the, uh, with the trust that had uh, donated that property. So the council will see that paperwork at your next meeting uh, in order to vote, uh, vote that and, and be done with that issue. Um, and so that's what I have in the fire station, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Councilor McKinnon. After the soil test and all that, is there any way to get one of these local towns in there, clear the lot a little bit, and just start buying stock ahead of time? Because as we know, by definition, we are in a recession. And the way the world's going, everything's going to keep getting more and more expensive and all that. And I'm just 
kind of question from the citizens. That's that's For actually the citizens, I should say. Yep. No, that's a uh, that is a great question. So uh, we're obviously obligated. Anytime we pay for anything, we have to go out to bid. Um, but uh, we did. The, our, both the architect and the uh, owner's project manager have recommended that we do um, a, basically what would be a site clearing package before you know as a separate um, as a separate uh, RFP. And I think that's a great opportunity for having you know real local uh, participation in the yeah. project. Um, and a, a lot of the subs when we start construction, I, I hope, will be local as well. But, uh, but certainly the site package will allow us to clear the property, right. um, get it prepared uh, for the uh, construction. Um, and it actually has sort of the ancillary benefit of, of often driving down the price of the general contract mm -hmm. uh, because general contractors can see the, the site, they can see that it's cleared, they can see any you know weird pieces of the site that they have to accommodate. So it's more predictable for them and, and inevitably when you uh, have a more predictable uh, site, you get a, um, a little, you know, uh, reduction in, in the, in the uh, bids. So, yeah. so that's, that's what we intend to do. Um, and, uh, and so that, that hopefully will be coming out prior to uh, September. September yeah. yeah. And one other quick question too. With the water station, is that March, April? When's that gonna be done? Water, the water, uh, the new water uh, treatment facility on High Street will be, uh, they're going through testing right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we are looking, I believe it's a, uh, I wanna say it's a April date. Uh, early, mid-April, right. uh, that should come online. Right. Thank you. It'll start making a difference. Good question. Thank you. Further questions for the town manager? I see none. Uh, moving on to discussions. We have a discussion scheduled this evening for, um, with respect to the town council's social media policy, and I'd like to turn things over to Councillor George. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so uh, the reason I brought this up is that the, I've, I've always kind of, I'll say struggled for the lack of a better term in regards to social media and our positions in the town council. Um, at the Massachusetts Municipal Association um, conference that we went to, a few of us went to, uh, I'll call it a seminar that specifically addressed social media. I think it was more around um, how people manage their social media page, you know, it's nice to hear some people talk about their staffers taking care of it. Well, our staffers are sitting right here in these seats. We don't really have that luxury. But one of the things that, that I brought up is um, I really have an issue with, with social media being used for personal attacks. And I'll, I'll just say counselors in general, um, and, and not specifically saying here, but you know, people putting up social media pages and putting out things and then letting it go like the wild, wild west. Um, so when I first brought this up, I, I did get a, a couple of calls. I got one from Councilor Moore, which was a great question in regards to the approach to this. this my approach to this is not going to be about trying to stop people that disagree with someone. I mean, that is the First Amendment, things of that nature. That is not the intent of this. Um, what I want to do is put something in place that gives everyone in the council the rules of the road in regards to social media if they so choose to have a dedicated social media page for a town council. That would be it. What you do on your own is what you do on your own. But I think we do have instances where there's a blur of the line between is there a person out there acting as their individual sense or are they acting as a town councilor? And we don't really have anything that's out there that defines exactly how you're going to approach it if, in fact, you do have a social media page. Um, you know, I would put it out there, too. You have to have guides in regards to open meeting law, you know, what you have to be careful of, what, what you have to go from there. You know, I, I'd also put it this way, too. If a, you know, counselor has a page out there and they throw out a question and people ask questions, that council is responsible for responding to those questions. Because unfortunately, we all get criticized for not responding to things in social media. Well, not all of us leverage social media. So if one council is, council is going to put something out there, I think in fairness, they need to own it on an individual basis. No one counselor speaks for the entire council, 
but that needs to be defined for new people coming in as well as old people that have been here for a while. We just don't have those rules of the road. But really my main focus for this is gonna be around, as I said, town council is monitoring their pages, answering their pages, but also being responsible for addressing comments that are, I'll say borderline, um, uh, disparaging. disparaging or, you know, if we, uh, unfortunately, what I think with social media, you know, um, just people go in a direction where I don't really understand how anyone can put things out there of a personal attack nature. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of the word in regards, Mr. Rollins, um, the word I'm trying to come up with in regards to a personal attack from a legal perspective, that's Libel. illegal. Oh, yeah. Libel and slander, about, excuse yeah, me, okay. libel and slander. So, you know, I think unfortunately with social media, libel and slander is, I, I don't know where the lines are drawn from that, but I would put it on a town councilor's responsibility that if something is of that nature and or if it even goes worse than that, we should have the ability to take that down and have the responsibility to report it if we so choose. But again, there are things I think up in the State House that are being discussed in regards to any elected official, and I brought it up with the school committee as well about being able to monitor and edit and things of that nature. Someone threw out you know, the ACLU. Well, if someone goes on and attacks another counselor, claims that they do something that they don't, and I take that down, I don't think I'd have a problem going to the AC, ACLU and say, show me how I'm suppressing free, free speech. So I'm just giving this an overview. Now I've got to you know, kind of go back and work with the powers to be about bringing something to the council, getting it to subcommittee, and then hopefully trying to get that probably included in our admin code uh, for future reference. So that's it. So thank you. Are there comments yes. or questions yes. from the council? Uh, yes, Council Lindy. Okay, so I think I wasn't privy to the Mass Municipal Association. Unfortunately, nobody informed me that that meeting was taking place because I would have gone to that. And I would like to see what other communities do before we go down this path. I worked in public access television for close to 40 years, which is people's right to go on and speak and use their First Amendment rights. I don't like, first, I don't like personal attacks. I moderate one of the pages. I keep them all off of that page, unlike the other page in town where people go nuts on people, but I think it's a slippery slope. I really, truly do. So I want to know more. I want to find another town like Bridgewater to see what they do, okay? I, I, I'm not privy to that conference. I'd love to see any materials or recordings from that conference. And, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> social media is a, a necessary and unnecessary evil at the same time. I'm very careful what I post, but I am, you know, the way we did it on our school committee is the chair of the committee spoke for the committee, okay, and the superintendent of schools. We have a town manager and we have a president of our council, but I also do think we have the right as individual counselors to post a page and communicate with our constituents. So in response to that, I think I said at the very beginning, this has nothing to do with telling a town councilor if they can or cannot have the social media page. That's the individual's decision. I don't do social media for, for town things because I choose to do that. Other people do it, that's fine. That is not the intent of this. The intent is if you are gonna go in that direction, there, in my opinion, there needs to be certain rules of the road and expectations so that people manage that in a proper way. And again, as I said earlier, I'm not looking for people to pull down posts because you say it should be A and the person says it should be B. But the other part too is, to be brutally honest and upfront, I don't really care if any town does it, maybe we're the first to do it, maybe we can look at other towns, maybe they do it and kind of adopt that, but I still think we need, we have a need for that and I'd like to move forward in trying to establish that. Councilor Moore. Um, I appreciate the, the perspective and I think all of us share the belief that um, you know, we, we don't want to see misinformation propagate through. Uh, we also don't, uh, we don't appreciate or want to see the personal attacks that are unfounded. I think the tricky thing for me really is um, the First Amendment piece of this. And I think if you go back in time um, with the start of like the printed word, the very first uses were to 
for politics, right? People were, were sharing their perspectives and they were trying to influence people. They were attacking people. They, some of them using things that led to libel laws, right? So, so part of my perspective is I think part of our country's history is that you actually have this protected right to, to use whatever words you want to engage with elected officials. Um, so that was my perspective, and I did a little bit of research just to see if there was case law. And uh, this is not legal op opinion. Uh, that's my <laughs> disclaimer. This is me reading. You might things. want to steer clear of it. Then. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, Before you get yourself, I, yeah, I, I, I would, I'm going to quote from. Well. I'm going to quote from articles. So I, I also I did reach out to the ACLU. They're very active in this space, and I just wanted to get their perspective. So I'm, I'm sharing. I'm quoting things. So there is a case right now in front of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Um, it's called Barron versus Southboro Board of Selectmen, uh, and it concerns a Southboro policy, I think for the school committee, but I'm not sure, but it says that allows public officials to censor criticism of members in public comment. And the policy says all remarks and dialogue in public meetings must be respectful and courteous, free of rude, personal, or slanderous remarks. Inappropriate language and or shouting will not be allowed. Um, so this is, uh, this is seen or being challenged as a First Amendment uh, right issue. Um, and the ACLU of Massachusetts uh, perspective on it is that it authorizes content-based and viewpoint-based discrimination in a form specifically created for members of the public to provide feedback, including criticism, to their public officials. Um, and that general theme uh, appears everywhere, that um, although we may not like the words that are being said, we may not even agree that they're facts, um, you have to be very careful about, about the censorship aspect of it. And then the, the specific thing is there actually are laws um, that regulate what we do on social media. And so I have seen versions of the policy that just reiterate the laws. Uh, and I thought maybe I'd share one. It's from a different state, but the laws are relevant. So it says that when you post on, on social platforms, you have to include like a disclaimer that says these opinions are my own and, and, and not the opinion of the town council. Right when we speak as town councilors, unless it's right here and we vote on it, it's our own opinion. So, so you just say that. They also say things like, um, you have to keep the content. You can't delete or you can't block any user. So if somebody says something horrible in the comment section, if we posted that as part of our role in this uh, as a counselor, we've created a public forum and you can't delete the comments in there. It's, it's the equivalent of, Stopping, yeah, censorship. Um, and then there's also, you know, other people have talked about, well, then we, we come up with a policy that maybe doesn't allow comments, and some towns have done that and agreed to that. But um, I raise these not because I'm a legal expert, uh, but because I, I, do, I do think part of what we sign up for in this position, and probably the reason so few people are signing up now, is pe people have the right to criticize us. And people do that in different ways. Um, and there are things that you certainly want to be able to stop, but you have to figure out who makes the call on what you can stop. And I think it's, it's you're, you're right on the edge of that like censorship line that makes dialogue with government officials inefficient um, and potentially prevents it. So I, I just say if we do go down this path, um, you know, I, I think we really need to understand the impact on First Amendment. As an alternative, I would say things like teaching us how to handle de-escalation. We have an amazing police department that is trained in this and does this every day, right? How do you engage with somebody who just came out and said something horrible and is, you're perceiving it as an attack? How do you engage in that to de-escalate and create a dialogue? Like those are, those are trainings we could get and get skills in that space. And so maybe there are alternatives like that that we could think about. Uh, but so I'd like to respond that. to that. Yeah, so I, I think, again, um, and I'll keep reiterating this, this has nothing to do with criticism. Um, I think with the First Amendment, and Mr. Rollins, correct me if I'm wrong, it's still illegal for someone to walk into a theater and yell fire. A am, am, I, am I wrong on that? Is it, what if it's okay, a public meeting it's a, and it, they're, they're saying they're fire him? Finish, please. <laughs> oh, so, oh, sorry. Just before you finish, just so I can fill in a little bit of a gap here. So you guys are talking about this in the hypothetical. Right, right which now. Is, right now, right. Which is almost impossible, right? Because until you have a policy in front of you that we can go line by line and say, 
this might be on the line of something I would say, we're probably infringing upon First Amendment rights here. This is a good idea because it, it you know, lets each of you know that we shouldn't do this for an open meeting law purpose. Mm -hmm. it, without that specific policy, it's almost impossible to talk about this, right? Because they're all hypotheticals. So as you know, I don't like to answer hypotheticals and because I don't think it's a good exercise and I don't think it benefits any of you. Um, I think you have to put pen to paper and we have to really look at what are we trying to accomplish? Are you trying to prevent someone from saying something? Are you trying to prevent other counselors from saying something? Is the goal to make sure that we don't have a quorum that then discusses it in something that isn't a posted open meeting? Mm -hmm. Is so, so that you have layer number one, which is this is the intent, right? First we have to establish what the intent of the policy is. And then you have layer number two, which is these are the specific things we want to implement based on that intent, right. right? And the intentions could be, you know, twofold. It could be open meeting issues and it could be uh, issues with dialogue, right? I, I don't know what they are, but before you get into like a real robust discussion of these are the pros and cons, this is what the First Amendment says, this is what it doesn't say, you got to know what we're talking about, right? right? We, we have to have pen to paper or, or it's really, I, I, have, I can't answer any questions because we have no I, idea, right? And I appreciate so. that. Hence the reason I brought this as something that I will plan on bringing in the future. I'm not looking for support. I'm not looking for endorsement. I did not think because of the content of the subject, it would really be a good idea to bring this out of left field, something pen to paper, and then go through this discussion around things that I probably should have brought to the table ahead of time. I'll just I'll just leave it at this, and I don't want to spend Maybe a lot. Can I jump in with a comment? Yeah, once I finish, Bill. <laughs> Council of Ward. I better hand raise for three speakers. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's my my job right now, and then you can have the free speech afterwards. Um, but I I will say I'll I'll leave it at this. I really struggle with um, what I what I see out in out on social media. I'll say out of decorum, I won't even bring some of the things that are put out there which I think is vile and disgusting. And I think this is also keeping good people from volunteering and running for office because now it's not about criticism. It's not about disagreeing or agreeing with a stance. It's personal attacks. It's things that are just absolutely vile and disgusting. Maybe I can get it done, maybe I can't, but I will not, not do it if if there's an opportunity to put it out there. And again, with Mr. Rollins, I'm not putting him on the spot in regards to whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. It'll be the council's decision from there. But at least I was trying to set the table about what I'm going to do so that it just doesn't come to the, to the council for the first time with no context whatsoever. I'll yield it to Mr. Wood. Uh, just just one other thing quickly, just for putting right. aside the content and, and the intent, I do think it could be incredibly valuable as it relates to open meeting. Right, that is the thing that I see from my perspective. You know, there's a lot of, the First Amendment is very broad, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's very difficult to interject legislation in, in that realm in any context, at the federal level, the state level, or the town level. So let's put that aside, that's a whole nother issue. But the open meeting part of it is something that mm -hmm. I do get concerned with. Yeah. Right? That's the reason I included that, in there. That is one of the things from my perspective on your level that you can actually probably come up with some policies on that I do think would make it easier, especially for new counselors who come in to say, oh yeah, I can't do this. I shouldn't be doing this. I think that would be incredibly useful. So uh, let me just say that. So whatever else, whatever other intents we have to look at, I think probably you could get a general consensus in, and I, you certainly can get a, a thumbs up from my perspective representing the town that the open meeting part of it is what I think could also be really useful, right? Uh, Councilor Wood, in, in, in just a moment, please. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment first that um, the councilors may remember that uh, just a couple of months ago, I distributed a news article uh, that I clipped from the, um, the Brockton Enterprise. I think it actually came from the, the Taunton newspaper and they picked it up. Uh, but in the, in the city of Taunton, this issue was recently um, a matter of con some concern because the 
council or the board of, uh, it is a city council, I believe, city council. Council. Uh, actually had um, rescinded public comment periods uh, because they were concerned about some things that were happening, uh, some concerns such as you would have, uh, 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 Councilor George. And uh, quickly the ACLU weighed in and um, uh, criticized the council in that regard because, uh, in fact, they were, um, um, because, they, the, because the council had allowed public comment and then determined it was inappropriate, we're gonna shut down public comment, uh, that was a viol violation of the First Amendment. So there is activity out there, there is something we could look to out there, maybe, this, maybe look at the town of Taunton, but I think we have to really compile some sources that would be useful for us and to put it forward in, in a coherent policy. Uh, uh, and I think it could extend not only to in-council uh, open meeting questions, but to social media policy as well. So it's perhaps a very good foundation for us to uh, do a lot of homework and to begin to compile some material and, and look at it. I, I think it's the kind of guardrails that uh, in the kind of contentious environment that we see today would be you know, really very prudent for us to put in place. Uh, if I will, uh, Councillor Wood, uh, I'm sorry to have uh, <laughs> postponed your comment. Thank please, you. please weigh in. Thank you. Um, you know, eight of us on the council are actually new councillors, um, even though some of us have been here for, for a while. Uh, the election uh, in January flipped uh, a lot of seats uh, around in terms of representation. I bring that up because in the packet, I think in the packet from the town clerk's office, you probably received um, that information about the open meeting. And if you go to the state website, um, I, I think it's still out there. I remember doing this a while ago, and I'll probably refresh it, but there is training on the open meeting. As Attorney Rollins points out, um, that's where you get into serious trouble, right? So uh, I, I, I appreciate and I agree with a lot of uh, Councillor George's remarks. Um, the thing to be careful about is, is uh, allowing your opinion to be seen about an agenda item outside of the council chambers um, by a quorum of the, of the council. And, and that's where the real danger is. And the open meeting law, uh, in, its, in its detail, and there's, there's summary, summary pamphlets and there's training and there's uh, detailed law behind that, um, really teaches you how to avoid those situations where you could run run into trouble. And if you follow those guidelines, those, those guardrails, as, as the president just pointed out, um, you easily stay away from danger of uh, articulating something that um, may get in, into you know, a, a deeper discussion, argument, or uh, you know, a conversation on, on Facebook or Twitter or some other social media, where uh, if you hold back on those comments, um, you don't, you don't uh, incite the conversation further, which is a, a benefit, but also you don't uh, violate the open meeting law statute as it's written. There are fines to, and other, um, other penalties associated with violation of open meeting law. It's a good law. Um, and so it really, I find it's, it's very restrictive um, which in a good, good way uh, because it does uh, prohibit engagement of a subject on one of the many Facebook pages that Bridgewater residents use. Um, uh, I will often throw out questions out there, but I stop at that. I, I will not answer a detailed question about something that's on the agenda because that could be, potentially could be, a violation of open meeting law if there are other counselors that see my, my response, my opinion. So um, while I may throw out a question or I may individually interact with somebody um, I, I won't do it uh, as, as in a broader sense where there is open visibility regardless of First Amendment rights and, and all that because uh, the open meeting law is there to protect the public. It's not there to protect the counselor or, or select boards or, or uh, other representatives like that. And so I think um, if you haven't seen it, uh, just look up open meeting law MA on your Google sheet. You can uh, find the training. Uh, I suggest that before we meet again on the subject, we all go through that exercise and uh, take a refresher course in, in that material. And that will simplify the process of what we need to do going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wood. Uh, further comments? Uh, yes. Yeah, Councillor Lindy. Um, I just want to ask one question and then I have one thing to say. 
you're talking personal attacks specifically, Sean, more mm -hmm. than anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That helps yeah. me clarify it has, things. It has not, nothing to do with not right. allowing people to comment. Right. But when it goes down to a personal nature, yep. that's when we that's when a counselor should be responsible for addressing and taking necessary steps. Yep. Outside of that, the back and forth, I agree with you, I don't agree with you, that's perfectly fine if a counselor so chooses to go in that direction. Like I said, I could bring copies of the things that I'm referencing. I wouldn't bring it in here because of decorum. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. I, and then the comment was, um, we're all subject to the open meeting law as counselors and local bodies. Just a reminder, the state legislature is not. They can do anything and say anything they want to do. And I think at some point in time, um, <laughs> it's got to be rectified. All right, thank you. No further uh, comments. We can move to uh, the legislation for action. So, sorry, can I ask you a question? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. So, so this is just a learning question. So is this something that would need to be put on the agenda and then we'd vote to say whether or not we want to pursue exploring a policy or? Right, so what I would do is I'd put together, I'd propose it, then it would go to committee, maybe probably rules and procedures. Um, I'm assuming it would go into the admin code. And then it would come back from rules and procedures. They would make their recommendation and any changes, ads, things like that. And then we would decide yay or nay on it to, to move forward. So that would, be the, that would be the process. Gotcha. Thank you. I mean, it, could, you. it could, in theory, be an ordinance or a resolution. I mean, I'm, I suppose you could look at it either way. Yeah. Or, or it could, you, you probably could supplement uh, the rules and procedures of your body, which do exist. Yeah. Um, with some sort of resolution that's just kind of supplemented into those rules and procedures. I don't, I don't know that it per se has to be a, like a, an ordinance, right? right. So we, we could discuss yeah. that. But okay. those, those are different things. They carry different weight in terms of enforcement of those things. Okay. All right? I think the other th comment just to that is I, I would like to suggest that it be as efficient as possible because I'm sure there's a lot of things that are strong priorities for this council as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, new business uh, order FY23-046, acceptance of gift, National Resources Trust of Bridgewater, uh, $25,000. Uh, I would uh, ask if the town manager has comment. Uh, the only comment, Mr. President, is this uh, is just for the sake of the council. As a reminder, it, uh, this money supplements the community preservation funds that you voted at your last meeting to cover the cost of the land survey uh, down on the Department of Correction property um, for an easement to construct the old, I think we're calling it the old State Farm Trail. So that's uh, just by way of a little background. Thank you. Uh, I would entertain a motion for referral to the Budget and Finance and Finance Committees. So moved. Second. second. Motion, motion and a second. Thank you. Any discussion? And seeing none, we will need a roll call vote, please. Mr. Wood? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Chase? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Dr. Perry? Yep. Mr. George? Yes. And Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you. Uh, order FY23-047. Uh, 2023 election debt exclusion ballot question. And uh, if you would please, Mr. Dutton. Thank you, Mr. President. As uh, most councilors know, some, some may not, that uh, the council decides what questions should go on the ballot. Uh, this is a question, uh, as I alluded to earlier uh, in the joint meeting with the school committee, um, this is a question that will have to go on a debt exclusion uh, question and ballot. And by way of background, the voters in the Bristol Plymouth Regional Tech District uh, voted to proceed with the construction of a new school. Um, that did not um, each so that did not uh, dictate how that that uh, school would be paid for. It just said that they could go ahead with mm -hmm. the construction. Each town now needs to cover the cost of that capital assessment. Bridgewater's projected share of the total project is about thirty-five million dollars over the course of the next thirty-four years. Um, and at its highest, um, the assessment on Bridgewater will be, I believe it's about a million two. Um, in any case, uh, breaks down to the, an average single family home paying an additional $33.16 per year. 
And we are proposing uh, to go to ballot because that, uh, there is not a way for us to absorb uh, $1 million uh, into our uh, general fund budget. So I encourage the council to refer to, um, actually I'm not sure, Community and Economic Development? Oh. Or no, I'm sorry, Budget and Finance and Finance Committee um, and proceed with that process. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. I would entertain a motion for for uh, recommend for referral. Second. Second for discussion. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Councillor. Uh, just a quick question through you to the town manager. Just from a informing the public timeline sort of perspective, um, do we think that there is enough time to appropriately educate the public on what they're voting on in time for the vote? Um, I. I think so. Uh, obviously, the election is in April, and we've got between now and April to really uh, get out and try to explain why, um, you know, why this is coming before them. I think for a lot of voters, they'll think, we already voted this, why is it coming back? So I think we've got, uh, we do have some explaining to do there, um, and I'm hopeful that we can get that message out effectively between now and then. Okay. Yeah, I think if we could accelerate that along with this, that would be great. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? And seeing none, I would ask for a roll call vote, please. Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Mr. George? Yes. Dr. Perry? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chase? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? Yes. And Mr. Wood? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you. Uh, moving to citizen comments. If there are citizens who would care to step forward and address the council, I invite you to do so now. Uh, yes, Dr. Hunt. Thank you for a great discussion again tonight. I really enjoyed that. Um, regarding uh, Mr. Mr. Ruley's thing, I think you see why I was so excited at the start of the meeting. You guys saw a really futuristic looking, thinking person. Um, I take four things away. The form-based code, I think, would advantage us in ways that we can't even imagine right now. So I think that's an urgent and important uh, issue. Um, as to a catalyst, um, quite frankly, as a chemist, uh, a catalyst without a plan is a failed reaction. I'm also looking forward to a real and a holistic work plan out of CED. I'm not sure if anybody's posed that, but I'm quite sure uh, that Mr. Rooley will in fact look and say, what are the critical, he says everything's on the plan, but we know that everything has to have some sequence to it. So I'm looking forward to a real work plan and holistic. Uh, and I'd like to see here a little bit more down the road, and maybe the town council's doing this, and the master plan has a lot of it. I worked on that uh, plan. But where will we be, where, where does CED see us within the perspective of what he's talking about in five years? In five years, what will we accomplish? That's the kind of thing I think we need to have to keep us moving forward on this. Thank you. Thank you. And seeing no other citizens for a citizen comment, uh, we can move to council comments. And I'd like to begin, please, with Councilor McKinnon. Nothing much. Just enjoy the Super Bowl weekend. Be safe. <laughs> if you're a true Patriots fan, hopefully no one wins. And that's about <laughs> it, you know? That's right. Uh, Thank you. Um, Councillor George. No comments tonight, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Councillor Perry. Just came up really fast once again, um, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, no, just, uh, you know, just uh, again, want to thank uh, Mr. Ruley for his presentation tonight. Uh, again, very comprehensive, um, very exciting details. Like I guess they just being here four to five weeks and he's got uh, a lot of wonderful ideas and I uh, look forward to uh, continuing to work with him on that through uh, council subcommittees and with the council as a whole. Um, other than that, uh, interesting perspective there, Mr. McKinnon on the Super Bowl, a Patriots fan. Uh, I might have to go along with that. So I, I have no skin in the game. I don't care what team wins. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councilor Moore. Sure. Uh, I was also really impressed with the presentation. Um, you know, I, I think we talk a lot about like individual pieces in the town. What can we do there? What could, and um, I feel like we're starting to have, as a group, really good conversations about the puzzle. Like, if we change that piece, does it still fit in? And what happens to the rest? And how do we change the rest? So, so that was just that was really good, and I'm excited to hear everyone's perspectives on kind of what that puzzle looks like. 
Um, you know, I, I think uh, we've also talked a little bit about data, and I think we saw some examples of facts that help us make decisions, right? The cost of rent, you know, once we do something like that, uh, maybe makes it prohibitive to attract the type of tenants that we want. So maybe we do something different. So it's this incorporation of data, and I talk a lot about it um, in terms of the people that are presenting to us, um, but I also think it's something that we as a council need to start incorporating into our committees and our, our decisions as well, just to make sure that we're, we're sharing facts um, and making good decisions based on them. So uh, overall, really positive meeting, though. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Robinson? Yeah. Um, well, this was actually a really fun first meeting for me, so um, I'm enjoying it, looking forward to working with you all, and uh, definitely concur, that, that presentation really excited me, and especially, you know, I know having served with Dr. Perry, Dr. Hunt on that Master Plan Ad Hoc Committee, um, it's really, really cool to start seeing some, some actual um, excitement and energy for that, so anyway, looking forward to the next one. Very good, thank you, and Councillor Lindy. I will echo most of the comments that already was said, but um, I like the discussion about development and downtown fitting all the puzzle pieces together. I think um, when we schedule that meeting next, that joint meeting between the FinCom, the school committee, and the council, we should consider an hour just as a general rule. I'm not looking to prolong any meetings because we're already having marathons, but um, it's, it's a lot of information, and uh, rather than be rushed with it, I think we might consider a 6 o'clock versus a 6.30, just putting it out there. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Gallagher? Yeah, I just want to uh, welcome Councillor Robinson to our first meeting. <laughs> yeah, we weren't here for the last couple, so uh, welcome. That's it. Nothing Very else. good. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wood? Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm at the um, end of my isolation period, um, feeling well. Um, I appreciate the hybrid meeting here. I do want to remind people that COVID is still in, in our community. Um, take it easy, take precautions. Uh, if you do get sick, uh, take isolation uh, pretty seriously because uh, it, it spreads pretty easily. Um, it affects some people heavily, some people lightly. Um, you never know. So um, I appreciate the hybrid meeting tonight. Um, I will be back in person with you next time. Um, one thing that hasn't really hit the news feed yet um, is that Mr. Dutton and his team has uh, secured a National Park Service grant for the Stiles and Hart Park in the amount of $450,000. Um, I've been working with Michael for you now probably for uh, five plus years on items around Stiles and Hart, uh, working with um, the, uh, the family um, at, at the, at, that owns Stiles and Hart, the, the uh, uh, Nick and Andrews and his family uh, to secure the parcel. Um, this, this money will mean uh, Bill, you went on mute. <laughs> That's because the host muted me. I saw that notice. <laughs> um, I, I don't know where I was, so we'll go back. Um, $450,000 for National Park Service grants. Uh, hopefully everybody heard that uh, as part of the news feed. Um, uh, that's that's something that uh, will enable us to really open up this South and Hart Park, and there's a, a few other pieces to that puzzle. But this is where we take, you know, uh, the center of Bridgewater, really the center, uh, a hidden gem, and we open it up to public access. And uh, there's many components to it, and a heck of a lot of people that have worked on this over the years. Um, but it's, it, I, I think it's really going to come together in the next year um, to be more accessible um, to the neighborhoods and uh, eventually, you know, with some parking um, accessible to people that, that live in Bridgewater overall. Um, if you haven't taken time to walk inside the park, um, there's, there's some ponds in there. So there's a few walking trails that have opened up, uh, and it's a really nice area. So um, I, I appreciate, um, Mr. Dutton, you uh, going after the grant and, and securing it for Bridgewater. I think that's very meaningful, and hopefully there's some more like that. Um, that's it for me tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I would certainly like to uh, also for myself and on behalf of the council welcome Councillor Robinson and uh, I note that we actually uh, the council was actually at full strength tonight uh, Thank you for participating uh, remotely uh, Councillor Wood to help us make that happen uh, but it's very exciting to see everyone here and uh, see um, 
see eager new faces uh, uh, and some old friends. And I think that we have uh, uh, a good deal of work ahead of us. I think certainly that uh, the presentation by uh, uh, Bob really had shown us great potential for development in the town and uh, revitalization. And we know that that's been uh, an item of concern to us for a long while. And I, I don't want to speak, uh, you know, too far in advance, but I have to think that we have crossed the threshold <clears throat> with uh, his appointment to uh, Community and Economic Development Department. I really think that uh, we can look forward to some good things. I think our cooperation with him is, is going to be very important. And I, I do hope that we can give him every uh, possible tool uh, that he'll need to have at his disposal to, to implement some of the kinds of plans that he has in mind. And, uh, and we'll be very much a part of that planning with him. So I, I look forward to that partnership and um, I'm very excited about it too. Um, I wanna thank uh, once again the uh, members of the uh, uh, Finance Committee and of the School Committee who uh, attended this evening. Uh, we certainly look forward to working with them very closely and I'm very glad that you know a number of questions of, of concern to the council were I think addressed and I think that uh, uh, we can expect to proceed ahead very um, in a very cooperative manner with the uh, school committee as the budget season progresses. So um, with that in mind, I have no further comment, but I want to thank everyone once again and thank the public for their input uh, this evening. And I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So motion. moved. Second. So we have a motion and a second, and uh, we'll need a roll call vote. Mr. Wood? He says He's yes. muted. He says Mr. Yes. Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Lindy? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Chase? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yep. Dr. Perry? Yes. Mr. George? Yes. Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Thank you. And good evening.